Wow, so good, so good to see some people that I haven't seen in a while. And it's great to see all of you who are here in the room. Lots of folks here today. We're, we're still wearing masks and all that good stuff. And so all of you who welcome, we welcome you uh, coming from home. We're so glad you're with us or maybe you're with friends. Maybe you're alone today, but you're not alone. The Lord is with you and we're here to encourage you today. So I am so, so grateful that you've come to join us. Um, you can go ahead and grab your Bible. Now, we'll get there here in a moment. Um, if you don't have your elements yet, sure enough, if you're at home, go grab those as well. You also, you'll see there's a QR code there um, that will help you as we walk through the sermon. We are always hopeful, not just here, like 30-minute sermon or so, uh, and then just, oh, yeah, I, that was good, um, uh, or not apply it. So what uh, the QR code does, takes you to a Bible study, really a study of the sermon uh, and helps you ask a lot of key questions about how you can apply it to your life. So I hope you'll do that and uh, grab your Advent guide and walk through it. I'm loving that throughout this season. It, it is the one singular thing really that guides us together every single day as we walk together. It's online, but you can also get a uh, copy with them all gone last week, and so there are more this week, all right? So snag those. I want to ask you, what is it? Some of you kids are thinking about this. What is it that you really want for Christmas this year? Um, and as adults, as we get older, and we still want stuff for Christmas, I suppose, but let me ask you the question. What do you think you really need this Christmas? If you had time to really think through that, I want to unpack that a little bit. I'm guessing, I got a hunch, that maybe what we need more than anything else in life is peace, Peace, you know, peace of mind, peace, peace in our hearts, peace in our relationships. You know, as a pastor, I've said this before, the thing that I pray over people more than anything else, um, they come to me, you know, want, want to seek some guidance or help or scriptural guidance or direction, uh, seeking prayer. In a word, it's peace. We all need peace in our lives. And so today I'm asking you to come home, come home to peace, all right? You know, all of us, um, having walked through this pandemic, we continue to go through this thing. And, and I read this week about the profound impact. We've talked a lot about this throughout the summer, even as we had a whole series on anxiety and depression and, and struggling and disappointment. Uh, we've been talking a lot about that. But I read from the World Health Organization uh, this week. I read this. It says that mental health consequences are likely to continue to grow throughout the pandemic and longer than even the peak of the actual pandemic. Um, now, we haven't seen a peak yet, by the way. Remember, there was a day we were talking a lot about a peak. Now we're continuing to see the numbers rise. And I'm hearing more and more people who are actually getting the virus in these days. A lot of us know folks who have. But I, I pray, I continue to pray against it and pray for safety for all of us. But they go on to say this. It says that, that suicide is likely to become even more of a pressing issue as the pandemic spreads and as longer-term effects take place in the general population and then in the economy and in vulnerable groups. And you hear all that and you're thinking, uh, thank you, Jeff, and Merry Christmas to you as well. Um, but I have great encouragement today. In terms of worry and, and struggle and, and all the tensions in life, Lack of peace in our lives. It doesn't have to be that way. Peace belongs in your life. You were created in Christ Jesus if you've received him. And not all of us have. Not everybody watching me has. I'm going to talk about that today. But if you have, you've been, or even if you haven't, you've been created at peace with God and peace in your soul. I want to ask you, are you experiencing peace in these days? I mean, like real soulful shalom kind of peace. I'm going to talk about that to get our minds around what biblical peace really is. Because here's why we have hope today. I want to get this foundational truth out there that we're going to build upon. And it's this. Peace is not the absence of conflict, but the presence of something else. And, and so when we think about peace I know that this, this, uh, this week I got a Christmas card. You, you may get a Christmas card that says peace on earth, right? One of those universal sentiments at Christmas time. And I think this one we, we don't fully understand. You might get a card that has a, like a snowy scene, like I'm like right, right here. Or how about that scene, that, that, that kind of cabin we were at in the mountains? How amazing was that? And, you know, it'll be something like that, like peace on earth, right? Um, you're you're going to find a, 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 maybe it's baby Jesus, like there's snow all around. And maybe there's little woodland creatures all around him smiling. Peace on earth. 
And yet when I, when I look at the gospel reading, I've been reading through the Christmas story again this season. I challenge you to do so all of Luke. Just read it over and over again. And when I look at the passage, I, I, see, I, I don't see any of that stuff. And I don't see what looks like peace at all. Because what we're going to see today, any kind of peace that's going to come in your life and mine, it comes with a price. It comes with a cost. And what I see with a raw, simple reading of the text is if I've never read it before, all the songs that we've now created images in our minds about what it was like, what I see is disruption taking place. Now, I love Christmas. I love all the singing. I love I love all the trees and decoration. I love the gifts. I almost love shopping, but I, I love the Amazon guy to show up in my house. And, and I love a lot about Christmas, a lot that we'll miss this year. But when I look at the scriptures and I really think hard about what went down that first Christmas, and you know this, there's only been one Christmas. All the others are celebration of the singular event that changed the world. When I look at that, I see a very different tone. Just think with me for a moment. Kind of deconstruct your ideas about this first Christmas. I sense mostly disruption at work. Terror is what is in the hearts of the shepherds. Uh, What we see with with, uh, Joseph is, is described as disbelief was his response. Shockingly. And what we see with Mary, she's deeply troubled by the angel's announcement. Can you imagine a teenage girl? in a close-knit Jewish community, legalistic community, finding out that she's pregnant, telling dad, everybody else in the community. Can you imagine? And then Simeon, you might know the story, the the older Simeon who meets uh, the Christ child finally before he dies, and then he turns to Mary. He offers this foreboding warning. He says to her, a spear is going to pierce your heart too. What? Mary's probably a teenager. She's probably this kind of Bedouin teenage Jewish woman who who has hardly come of age and now all of this. And then even in her uh, praise, her song of praise, we call it the Magnificat. Even there, she, she speaks of rulers being overthrown and proud men scattered. When I look at Christmas, Even in the scriptures, it teaches us from the very start, something of a great disruption is taking place. Rightly understood, a war has begun. And this baby is about to usher in a revolution, such as the world has never seen before. And so an army shows up. An army of angels shows up. And this army comes not with tanks and and planes and swords and guns. This army comes pronouncing, watch this, a war is about to begin, they pronounce peace. Because a disruption has already taken place. And that disruption is our sin against holy God. Disruption precedes peace is what we're going to discover today. But look at this, peace is not then the absence of conflict, it's the presence of a person. And not only that, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to talk to about how we can, before we finish this, peace is found in a person, but it's found in close proximity with that person. And the further you are away from him, the less peace you have in your life. A lot of us are experiencing an unrest, dis-ease, a lack of peace in our lives, anxiety and worry. It's because we're not truly walking with him. So what does this look like? We know what war looks like. What does peace look like? Uh, To understand peace from a biblical perspective, you have to understand the word shalom. You've heard that word, right? It's a Hebrew word, shalom, from a a, a, a root word is shalom, and real close to it. But it means uh, to have a a, a safe, to to be safe in in your mind, to be at peace, to be at ease in your body, your whole well-being, your whole estate is, is at ease and peace. Here it is, true biblical shalom, this is the definition, really, it refers to an inward sense of wellness or wholeness. Think about that. If you are a whole completeness, completely whole and well within your heart, mind, and soul, you're at peace, right? And, and so as we think about peace, that's what I want you to have in your mind. Even in Israel today, um, I've been to the Holy Land, even there you still, you can greet someone with a shalom and you say goodbye with shalom. It's a common phrase. And what it means is blessings essentially to you, holistic health and healing and wholeness to you. 
in your family. It's another, like, almost like saying prosperity, but like real prosperity. What really matters even has a sense of this overflowing. When you have shalom, you have so much in you and peace in you that it overflows with the kind of generosity to everyone around you. So this peace is not the absence of conflict. In the American mind, if I could just get rid of that problem, if I could get rid of that, if I could just pay that off, if I could buy that, if I could have that thing, I'll have peace in my life. Get that person out of my life, I'd have peace. No, no, no. In the midst of conflict and all the struggle and trial that you have going on in your life today, and I'd like for you to just name it. What is it that you're really concerned about in these days? What is it that is bringing worry, anxiety? Maybe it's relationships. Maybe it's a challenge. You're concerned about the future, concerned for a child or someone in your life. Listen, you can be at peace well and and whole if you listen and apply this message today. I truly believe it. Jesus said this in John 14, 27. Uh, This is our memory verse for the week, by the way, in our Advent guide. I'm leaving you well and whole. This is my parting gift to you, peace. His, some of his last words, he says, this is what I'm bringing to you. If you are well and whole, as Jesus says he's going to bring to you, you will experience peace on earth, peace in your life, peace in relationship. Peace belongs in your life. Stop living without it. So we're going to prepare uh, for the Lord's Supper again. So grab your elements there at home. We'll get to that here in a moment. But as we do... I want you to see that peace comes when we encounter Jesus in three ways. It's right in the text. We encounter him as Savior. We encounter him as Messiah. Christ, Christos, is Messiah and Lord, Master. Those three is how we're going to roll today. So turn to Luke's gospel in chapter 2, Luke 2. We're going to look at verse 18 through 14. All right, so if you have your Bible, grab it. Uh, We'll put these on the screen, but you can take notes. If you have a journal or write, take notes. You can do that right now. Now, last week, let me set this up while you're turning there. Um, We looked at Isaiah's prophecy. And in in Isaiah 9, uh, verse 6 through 7, he says this, for a child has been born for us. And we're looking at the message throughout this month. This is a great translation, by the way, for us, he says. This is exactly what the text says. The, The gift of a son for us. He'll take over the running of the world. He's coming and listen, he's come for us. The theologians in Latin, the word is pro nobis. He is for us. He's come to us. Now he's for himself as we bring glory to him, but he is for us and he's gonna run. He's gonna take over running the world. And his name will be, we sang about it when we began our service. Amazing counselor, strong God, eternal father, prince of wholeness. You know the translation probably, right? Prince of what? peace. This is a, this is shalom. This is a great translation right here. Wholeness and wellness. And then look what it says. His ruling authority will grow and there'll be no limits to the wholeness that he brings. There'll be no limits to this shalom that he's going to bring to everyone. And then 400 years later, the promise would become a reality. When in Luke two, verse eight, it says this, there were sheep herders, shepherds camping in the neighborhood. And they had set night watches over their sheep. So they're taking turns looking. Suddenly, out of nowhere, God's angels stood among them and God's glory blazed around them. And they were, here it is, terrified. I mean, like an angel. Now, I know your little nativity scene has a little angel. You put that one up last. It's sticking maybe on the stable or something. He's putting him right there. He's hanging up, you know, and he's got wings. And it's probably a woman, you know, there's some girl flying around. And, um, and what we see, no, he's just standing there. And we see this angelic creature. That's what happens. In fact, they misunderstand that sometimes they don't even know it's an angel at times along the way. We have these images in our minds, again, of what this first Christmas was like. But here's what's happening. I see anything but peace here. A major disruption is taking place in the lives of these shepherds. Look at verse 10. It says, the angel said, don't be afraid. I'm here to announce a great and joyful event that is meant for everybody worldwide. So immediately the tone changes a little bit, terrified, but now they offer the number one command in all of scripture. You know what it is, right? Fear not. Don't be afraid. And that is always followed with because the Lord is with you. And here the Lord, his presence is with them immediately. Still in shock, but now this is good news of great joy. And then comes the greatest birth announcement of all time. Now, now I know that a lot of our young couples have just recently had babies, even 
even in, in COVID. I just saw one of our little babies out there just, you know, born during the pandemic. You may have had an awesome uh, birth announcement, uh, maybe, I don't, but no, not, n- not, not so awesome. This right here, the angels show up and here's the announcement. Here's the announcement. A savior has been born in David's town, town of Bethlehem, a savior who is Messiah and master. Savior, Messiah, and master. All right, so how bizarre is this announcement? No blue confetti coming out of a cannon, right? No balloons popped with blue, blue, you know, smoke all over the place. Instead, they say, you're gonna find a baby wrapped in a blanket in a feeding trough. That's the big announcement. In obscurity, in humbleness, he comes. Everything about Jesus' life, even his coming, teaches us about how we're to live our lives. Look at verse 13. It says, at once the angel was joined by a huge angelic choir. Now, there's some debate here. We we often think, okay, a big choir up there singing, and now they're all in the tenor section, and then there's the altos up here, and they're all around. And and it, it doesn't literally say singing. It says saying, praising. But we often connect singing, as we do here, singing with praising. And it says glory. They're all proclaiming, at least we know that. Glory to God in the highest. Doxa is the word in the Greek glory. Doxology. They're singing praise to God in the heavenly heights. Peace. That's it. Here it is. Praise him. Peace to all men and women on earth who please him. So the great proclamation, the central proclamation, the baby has come. And this baby is bringing peace, wholeness, and wellness to all of us. Peace to all. And so the first thing I want us to see, I'm going to spend more time on this first one, then we'll uh, move toward the Lord's Supper with the next two. But peace comes when you encounter Jesus as your Savior. Now, I'm not going to presume that everyone has had a moment in your life where you've received Christ as your Lord and Savior. You receive him as Savior when you say, I can't rescue myself. I need a savior. In fact, we could go right past this. This is why Christmas, why we have Christmas at all. Because we are desperate for a savior. And here's what I'd say. Here's another truth I want you to see today. Disruption precedes peace. This is true at Christmas time, as I've already noted. The reason we're disrupted by the very angel's announcement and the coming of Jesus is because of our sin that has separated us between a holy God. We've, we've caused the disruption. But now through a holy uh, act of God, his presence comes upon us. But this is true. We always see this. Disruption precedes peace. This is true in your life. It's true among nations. It's true in relationships. It, it's true uh, in, in marriage. It could be true with your, with your roommate and friends. The deeper you go into relationships, the more you're going to have conflict that then leads to greater understanding, knowledge, wisdom, and love, right? We talk to our nearlywed class. What we do is teach our nearlyweds, those who are getting, uh, getting married, we, we teach them that, hey, conflict is not a bad thing. Conflict is. It's going to happen. Managing conflict and being able to resolve conflict is what takes your relationship to deeper levels. If you're in conflict now in relationship, listen, embrace it, move into it, speak into it, and, and let the Spirit lead you with grace and with truth. Truth has got to prevail in relationships. And so what we do, when I'm, when I'm doing a wedding, I'm looking over the prepare inventory that we do. Um, this, this instrument that we use to help, help couples determine their growth areas and their, 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 their strength areas. And, and what I want to see out of about eight or ten of them, I want to see three things at the very top. One of them is conflict resolution. One of them is communication. The other is a spiritual compatibility and unity. And then there's other things in there, all, all kinds of other areas and such. But those are key. And conflict resolution is critical. And what happens in relationships is, yes, disruption precedes peace. There's disruption before true peace can come. And don't miss that today. If you're, if you're, you know, you got something that's kind of bugging you, uh, approach that person. And particularly if it's a spouse or someone in the family, you, you resolve conflict and you grow deeper in love. This is what God has done for us. All this is driven by a premise, this truth that our sin has already created the disruption between us and God, your sin and mine. 2,000 years later, all you got to do is look at today's news feed and see that there's, there's, there's not a lot of peace in the world. Peace between nations, peace 
you know, in, in our marriages, in our families, some churches don't have peace. Peace is in governments between, how about in our own government there's not peace? Why is that? Because sin has, has caused us to be self-centered. Sin makes us enemies with God. It's why in Isaiah 48, 22, it says, there's no peace for the wicked. If you, if you, to the degree, how about this, that you are involved in sin and unwilling to repent, it is to the same degree that you experience unrest and dis-ease and, and, and a lack of peace in your life. This is true for every non-believer that has not yet received Christ. You'll never have peace in your life until you receive Christ as your Savior. Bridging the gap between you and a holy God. But this is true for us as believers. As we, yes, we've received Christ as Savior. But what happens is if we're unwilling to give our hearts and lives totally to him, we will experience to that same degree unrest and dis-ease in our lives. In fact, I want to I show you something. You've probably seen this uh, on your phone. I, I know I have. I saw this this week. This shows up on, on my phone. Um, Y'all know that, like it strikes terror in your heart for a moment, right? You're like, wait, 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 wait what do I do? What do I do? Oh, my gosh. Hold. No, don't hold on. Never mind. What's more important? What about, have you ever done that? That happened to me a couple times this week. And you're either going, eh, I can wait on that. I can call them back. No big deal. Or, hey, I was expecting this call. I'm sorry. And you totally diss the person you're talking to, right? Like, I thought I was kind of important, but okay. And here, here's my point. What happens in our lives, what happened to the shepherds, their lives were totally di disrupted. And when you get a call like that, what happens when God comes and shows up? And I'm, I'm talking to some people right now. God, it's why you're watching me right now, why you're here. God is showing up in your life right now. And he is, he's calling you to turn to him and give your life to him. And you've got an option there. You've got a choice to make. You, you can either, you can end the call. In where you're heading, in what you're all about, in your life, and say, I'm going over here because God is calling me out. And this is what it means for him to be, yes, Savior of your life. And yes, Messiah, liberating King and Lord of your life. But here's what too many of us do. God, I, I, I hear you, I got you, um, but I got a lot going on here. Um, hang on just a sec. I'm going to put you on hold. Hey, you know what? I got God on the line. Uh, better get back to him. May I'll, I'll get back to him la later on. I think. Uh, um, God, hey, hey, I'm uh, back. I'm back. But uh, hold on, I got another call coming, and that's how we live our lives. Instead of saying, you know what, I'm done with that. I'm done with that. He's disrupting my life. And when this holy disruption comes into your heart and your life, it changes your life completely. If you've not received Christ as Savior, today is your day. But I want you to see this. He, he comes and he shows up. Peace comes when you encounter Jesus as Messiah. Messiah means literally liberating king. He comes to liberate us from our sin. He doesn't come just to save us, but he gives us this, what I call this explosive power of a new affection that, that just diminishes every other affection in my life. And because of that, I'm able to overcome sinful habits in my life as you pursue him. I want to ask you, what is it that you're wrestling with today? Sinful attitudes, sinful, uh, maybe it's re relationships or habits or patterns in your life. He's come to liberate you from that, to set you free from that. And as he sets us free, and the process of growing more and more like our Savior, Jesus, the process of sanctification, we call it. He becomes then, he, we allow him, he is, he is Lord of all. And Jesus, watch this, peace comes when we encounter Jesus as master, as your master, as your Lord. That's the word. The proclamation of every person, every believer baptized is Jesus is Lord. He's master leader of my life. When we talk to folks who are getting baptized, I, I explain to adults and children, this means when you say Jesus is Lord, it means you're saying he's master leader of your life. You are off the call. You're on to another life altogether. You don't go back. And so do you see here, there's kind of a progression. And, and I want to land with this and then we'll move to the Lord's Supper. You see almost a progression here. It's not explicit in the text, but, but in our Christian lives, we receive Christ as Savior. We're rescued. We have now a totally new identity, and we're destined for a new eternity when we accept Jesus as, as a Savior. 
He rescues us from our sin. Then we, we say, you know what? I need liberation from these sinful habits. And, and it's a constant battle in my life. I need Christ as Messiah in my life. And, and yes, I want him to be Lord of my life, leader, master, ruler. Friends, peace comes through a person and it comes in proximity to that person as you live with him. Sanctification, rightly understand, is, it rightly understood, is, is a greater, greater understanding of who he's already made me to be. It's, it's almost like this. It, it would be like sanctification. To become like Jesus is to put on the righteous clothes that Christ has already placed on you. It's like a little kid putting on, putting on dad's clothes. Like, yeah, it's too big for you. The shirt's giant. It's all over the floor. No, 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 but watch me grow into it. Watch me grow into this thing. As I'm saved, I, I'm, I, he rescues me from my sin. He liberates me. From my sin, my sinful habits, he strips away everything that's not me. I'm growing up to be more like him. He's Lord of my life. Let me ask you, where are you in relationship to him tonight, uh, this, this morning? Where are you in relationship? Is he, is he your savior? I wonder, even in the room now, maybe, maybe home, how many of you would say, Christ is my savior? I've received him as my savior. How many of you say he's, he's savior, right? And then and I'll put it this way. How many of you aspire? You long for him to be, you want him. How about this today? You want him to be the liberator of sin in your life. How many of you could join me? Say, I want, I want him to liberate me from sin in my life. And can you honestly say today, as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper, can you honestly say, I want him to be Lord of my life. I want you to raise your hand high if you want to say, I want, I want Jesus to be Lord of my life. Lord of every bit of my life. And in so doing, you're saying, Lord, here, I'm, here I am right here, right here. I, wanna, I want you to be Lord of my life. He is Lord, whether you believe he's not or not. It doesn't change, right? You can have that, that, that same kind of relationship. It's like my relationship with Stacy. Same person, progression of relationship. When I met her, she was an acquaintance. We started dating. I was her boyfriend. Changed, changed who I was in relation to her. I became her fiance. I changed my relationship with her. I became her husband now. And, and, and all of these years, we've been growing and growing in our relationship with one another. Same person. I'm the one who's tra changed and transformed. Now, granted, in marriage, we're all transformed and, and changed. Or in good friendships, the same happens in our relationships. But with Jesus, he is Savior. He is Messiah. He is our master, peace comes. Peace comes when you find that you're content in him alone. Here's what I've learned, friends, and I'm learning these days. Uh, I, don't have to go, I don't have time to go into this, but I've been learning. You know where peace comes from? Je Jesus was born in obscurity and humble, in a humble place as a little baby. You ever wonder why in the world? Why did it happen that way? And then he was born only to do the will of the Father. And in the same way, when we decide... I will be content to live in obscurity. I'll be content to humble myself without praise, without fame. And I will do God's bidding without anyone watching. I'll just be a faithful presence wherever he puts me today. That's peace. That is peace. And that's where peace comes from in your life. Amen. And so you can live with peace. I just ask you again today, will you come home to Jesus? Will you come home to him as Savior, Messiah, and Lord?